Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this Onc Live peer exchange panel discussion on the topic of clinical challenges in genitourinary cancers. An increased understanding of the underlying biology of prostate and bladder cancers, coupled with recent clinical trial findings, are improving treatment options in these tumors. However, there are still many clinical scenarios for which there are no clear-cut answers. This OncLive peer exchange will focus on some of the more challenging scenarios facing both oncologists and urologists in the genitourinary field, using a case-based approach to bring about important discussion points. My name is Raul Concepcion, and I'm the director of the Advanced Therapeutic Centers at the Urology Associates in Nashville, Tennessee. Participating today on our distinguished panel is Dr. Michael Cookson, professor and Donald D. Albers Chair in Urology at the Stevenson Cancer Center of the University of Oklahoma Science Centers, Dr. Daniel Petrolak, Director of the Genito-Urinary Oncology Research Program and Co-Director of the Signal Transduction Program at Yale Comprehensive Cancer Center, Yale School of Medicine, Dr. David Quinn, Medical Director at Norris Cancer Hospital and Clinics, Head of the Genitourinary Section, Division of Oncology, and Associate Professor of Medicine at the Kenneth J. Norris Jr. Comprehensive Cancer Center, a part of the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California, and Dr. Neil Shore, Medical Director and Certified Physician Investigator at Carolina Urologic Research Center in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Thanks so much for joining us and let's begin. So the first case that we are going to discuss today is a 63-year-old white male who in 2007 was diagnosed with high-grade prostate cancer and on biopsy was found to have multiple cores of Gleason 4 plus 5. He was evaluated, worked up by urology in October of 2007, opted to undergo radical retropubic prostatectomy, and at the time was noted to have pathologic T3C disease, N0M0. This was subsequently followed up because of the high risk of, of recurrence with external beam radiotherapy to the pelvis. He was followed again by his urologist and in, in November of 2010 started having a rise of his PSA biochemically, was started on continuous androgen deprivation therapy for a PSA rise to 5.4 nanograms per ml and a very rapid doubling time of seven months. With the institution of androgen deprivation therapy, he did have a PSA drop to less than one nanogram per ml was being followed very closely by his urologist, but in February of 2013, developed castration-resistant prostate cancer with a PSA of 4.3 nanograms per ml and a testosterone level of less than 10. He had a staging workup, including technetium bone scan and CT, which showed iliac nodal disease, but no evidence of osseous or bone metastases on bone scan. The options were discussed with him, and in April of 2013, the patient underwent three cycles of Sepula cell T. He was then followed very closely again by urology. October of 2013, approximately six months after his uh, initiation of Sepula cell T, his PSA was 7.5 nanograms per ml, alkaline phosphatase was 95. January of 2014, PSA had a rise to 10.7 testosterone less than 10, and in July of 2014 had now a, a more significant rise of his PSA to 19.8 nanograms per ml. He was still in the castration range of testosterone of less than 10, but a bump in his alkaline phosphatase at this time to 145. The urologist at this point opted to restage him, and he was found to have a one centimeter left common iliac node, multiple bone lesions to T12, L2, sacrum, the right tenth rib, left scapula, but was asymptomatic at this time frame. So we had this gentleman who has progressed despite definitive therapy, aggressive definitive therapy, has now received Sepula Cell T, which is an immunotherapy that was approved in 2010. So Mike, you are the head of the AUA Guidelines Committee for Metastatic Castration Resistant Prostate Cancer. Give us your insight where he stands now 
what the, uh, what, what the guidelines say about this particular patient and what, what things should be taken, what the urologist, medical oncologist ought to be looking at for this patient. Thank you, Raul. This is an interesting patient, and there is a little more that I would need to know to enable to fit him into the AUA guidelines. As you know, the AUA guidelines not only took the FDA-approved agents and classified them based on patient profiles, but they needed certain other information, and that included performance status, which we would assume is pretty good in this 63-year-old man, um, whether or not he had symptoms, and that's not really been discussed yet. If he had minimal symptoms or was asymptomatic, which I assume he was when he received his CIPT, um, then you have certain options. If he is symptomatic with these bone lesions in the absence of visceral metastases, that opens up another avenue. So a little bit about that is um, more needed to be able to clearly define him in the index patients of the AUA. But in minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic patients, certainly we have active agents that have improved the survival. Those include enzalutamide, abiraterone, docetaxel. We've already mentioned the use of sipulucyl T. Um, if he moved into a more symptomatic stage, those agents would also be included, but because of the bone lesions, the absence of visceral metastases, radium-223 would be an excellent option as well.